Welcome to Cultura Latina, a cultural series giving you the what's what and who's who in Latin American art, food, cinema, and lots more. Every week we'll explore different countries and the cultural features to see what makes them so special. Follow the music, admire the art, place yourself inside historic architecture. Every week, here on Tell Us Your English. Welcome to Cultura Latina. In this first edition of Cultura Latina, we'll take a look around in Ecuador's cinema landscape as cinematographers and producers share inside stories of what constitutes 21st century film in Ecuador and how the industry deals with challenges in film production and distribution. We'll look at what some see as a renaissance in Ecuadorian cinema. Recent years have seen the Ecuadorian National Film Fund created in 2006 grow exponentially. Last year, it disbursed $1.1 million and produced 13 features and documentaries. When the country created the National Film Institute or Sencine in 2006, it produced one film a year on average and prior to 1999, only one film every four years. This thriving industry is already bearing fruit with award-winning productions making waves at Cannes, Berlin and Toronto. Today on Cultura Latina, we'll be talking with one of the pioneers of this boom, Tania Armida. Born in Cuenca, Ecuador, and started film directing at the San Antonio de los Baños International Film and TV School. She has taught here in Quito at the San Francisco de Quito University and bridges politics and art, having contributed to Ecuador's new constitution. Her first film from 2006, Que Tan Lejos, was critically heralded and helped pave the way for the new wave of Latin cinema. In Ecuador, one of the great things that has happened in the last years is that uh, the films that we're making are, uh, many of them are first time filmmakers. And that always has this fresh uh, approach to reality, uh, this fresh uh, view on things, and this fresh way of telling stories also. Uh, and there's like a, a huge, um, difference between, for example, the documentary films that have been made that have been very successful internationally and in theaters in Ecuador, which are like, and our contemporary history is being told by, by those documentaries. And there's the fictions that also like show uh, different aspects of our culture and different aspects of our recent history too. I think it's a very interesting cinematography to watch. And in the future, it, it will be better. The films of Tania Armida are crafted in a remarkably distinctive way. She constructs her backdrops from environment and memory of her formative years, creating fully realized scenes that resonate deeply with broader audiences. The delicate touch of the filmmaker's cinematography whisks the viewer away to lush emotive landscapes with Ecuador's striking countryside. In her own words, the advantage of independent filmmaking is the ability to have a team of people fully involved in the story, and that's a formula for a potent cinematic experience. I saw several road movies, but I really like had already an idea about what, what I wanted to do. I wanted I was sure I was I wanted to do it in the Andes and the mountains would have like a very important role and the sea and the fog and the climate and it was like a very um, geographical movie for me. In El Nombre de la Hija, actually I said okay I'm going to make a completely different film. I want to, to tell the story of this little girl in the 70s confronted with these two ideologies inside her family which is uh, the communist father and the very Catholic grandmother and all that. And um, my inspiration was actually, I needed to tell that story because it has a lot to do with my own childhood. And, uh, but then when I made the story, when I was already in the editing room, I realized that Que Tan Lejos and En El Nombre de la Hija have so many connections, although there are different times, different uh, main characters, a different story, uh, different style in, in shooting and, and everything, but they have many connections because they all have to do with this 
uh, girl in one case and this woman in the other case, young woman who start like with very uh, firm ideas about themselves and about the world and about with these certainties and truths that they hold and they in, in, in the movie they they lose all that they lose certainty they lose these truths they lose their dogmas in a certain way many years for many generations all the filmmakers in Ecuador had been like uh, struggling to have a, a film law, a film uh, institution, film funding and it hadn't been possible for several reasons and then finally after many uh, steps uh, at the end of 2005 or 2006 I'm not quite sure right now we finally got to get a, a law approved. I start to think that, I start to see that our films nowadays, they are, uh, they belong like to a, a very small um, part of the population. We need to diversify that to other views, to other languages, to other uh, cosmovisions and maybe then we can talk about a golden age. I mean, in terms of quantity, yes, it's a golden age. Sometimes I feel that we have a tendency, not only in Ecuador, but in, in general in, in Latin America, and I have a critical view on that, of, uh, I call it in Spanish, folclorización de la miseria, which is like making, making our own miseries very picturesque to be seen from uh, an external view. And I find that very complicated because I do believe that uh, for every filmmaker, but for us, uh, the first important view is our own view of what we are, of what we think about our ourselves, and of how we imagine our own stories and how we imagine what we could become. And having something that is only interesting for an external view that finds us uh, picturesque uh, I find that quite um, complicated because in a sense it's, it's, it's a way of making a show for somebody else which is a very subtle form of colonization. What I do believe is that not only the production but the festivals for example and the schools that are, have been, that are being created for filmmakers do show us that it's another moment. Before making my first feature film, I worked uh, with some independent German films that were done here, like low-budget independent German films. And then came Proof of Life, which was like huge industry film uh, with uh, an amazing <laughs> amount of people and resources of all kinds. And then Maria Full of Grace, which is again a very small independent film made in, in, in Ecuador, but uh, with a US budget. And for me, the experience was incredible because I was assistant director in, in, in every case, and I was like very close to what happens on set and what happens on, 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 on during shooting and behind the shooting and with the actors. If you have Russell Crowe on set and Meg Ryan and 250 people and 30 trucks, as a director, I had the feeling that you are not, you have not more freedom, you have less freedom when you have to make decisions from the very small decisions on set to the very big decisions on even on script because you, you, you have contracts signed with so many people concerning what you can do, what you cannot do, how many takes, and how and when and why, and, and how many people you have to have on set because of uh, uh, union uh, obligations and everything. I was amazed. I really, I really found that you don't, you are not free. 
you, you're just a tiny little part of a huge uh, thing. And then in Maria Full of Grace, uh, that was different. I found that the director had a m much more freedom to do what the film he wanted to do with m much less um, resources, of course. When you have 250 people working with you every day, you realize that the people are not really committed with the film. They're just workers doing their work as they would work in any other uh, fabrica, you know? And that was quite sad because in a small film, and that's how I was used to work and I, how I am used to work, everyone, even the, the driver, is involved in what you're doing and, and has, has like a commitment to the story and to the, to the whole project. It's like a community thing. It's not like an impersonal thing where everybody does what he has to do and that's it. It's a collective project. I always knew, but I realized that the films that I like to do uh, are of course the movies where you're free, where you are like you're, you are the, the only person who decides uh, what actor you choose, what actress you choose, why you choose them what location you choose and why, and uh, how many people you want to work with, <laughs> and how many people you want so near you on set, and, and you establish like your own dynamics. And, um, and in any case, I didn't have any, the chance of making a, a Hollywood movie either, <laughs> but <laughs> it was like uh, interesting to have that experience for once and to see it so close. And that's it for today's episode. We hope you watch next week for another look in Latin American culture. See you around.